and comparison. We are grateful for the privilege of your holy word, the constitution of the kingdom. We come as citizens of your kingdom to inquire of you. Lord, teach us marriage. We don't want to be ruled by culture of humans. We want to understand kingdom culture of marriage. Teach us by your spirit. Grant us understanding. Thank you for answering our prayer. For in Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Today, I'm like to share with you 10 pillars of kingdom culture marriage. 10 pillars. You see, this course is course 124, marriage, a kingdom perspective. Marriage and family, a kingdom perspective. Now, what it means is that we are not talking about marriage from the point of view of Christian religion. We are not talking about marriage from the point of view of culture. In this place, we have different culture. Right here, as I'm looking, I see Chinese culture by my left. I see, um, you know, re, um, Delta culture. I see Zimbabwe culture. I see Igbo culture. I see Ghana culture. I see Jekiri, Jakiri culture. I see Uganda culture. I see um, Yoruba culture. I see right here, just by my left. Then I see Caribbean culture. I see culture of you know, northern Edo state towards the middle belt. I see Uganda here. I see Igbo here. I see Zimbabwe. I see people from different backgrounds. And each background, each group of people, there is a way, they, there is a way of life. Culture is the way of life of a people. And one of the biggest problems you will ever face in the issue of marriage is to look at marriage from the prism of a culture, natural culture, or the prism of the world. That's the, the other word for natural culture is the world. Or from the prism of governments. As I shared on Thursday, governments can define relationships the way they want. But government cannot define marriage. You cannot define what you, are, you didn't create. You can only define what you create. So government can create a relationship pattern and call it a name and give it um, a process, you, you attain it. But when it comes to marriage, you are talking about something, the origin is as early as the dawn of, of civilization. Turn with me to Genesis 2 again, what we studied on Thursday, so that we will know what the Lord is saying. Genesis 2, verse 18. And Elohim said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. It's not good. I don't want Adam to be alone. I'm going to create a help meet for him. And the Bible says, out of the ground he created all manner of animals, brought them to Adam. None was found. None was found. He gave names to all. None was found. Then the Bible says in verse 21, and Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which he, the Lord Elohim had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. In creating the institution of marriage, the Lord made sure that the foundation was in oneness. Some of say oneness. Out of the man he brought forth a being. He, the woman came from the man. And I told you on, on Thursday that in creating man, Elohim stooped stoop, stoop low, scooped earth from the ground, created man. And in that state of rawness, raw mankind, he created man and made him a living soul. 
Now, when it was time to create the woman, I said to you on Thursday, he didn't bend down to create a woman from the earth. He rather took part of the rib and closed it with flesh to make a woman. That womanhood signifies refinement. Can we say it together? Womanhood signifies refinement. That's why women are spiritually, they can see more than men. Spiritually, they tend to see more. They are more sensitive to things of the spirit. At the same time, women are also more open to demonic oppression because of that same sensitivity to things of the spirit. The enemy knows there's something in womanhood and he does everything to squash it. And so, the Lord created woman out of man and then he made, you know, he brought her to the man. And we said on Thursday, don't keep your eyes open to find your own wife. If you keep your eyes open, you might find what you think you want that may not be who you need. Elohim of heaven considered it necessary to put Adam to sleep. And we said, for you to find your missing rib, you need to go to sleep first. The sleep that your senses are retired and you are no longer operating your carnality. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, the carnal mind receiveth not the things of the spirit of Elohim. So if you are using your carnal mind, you want to define, you know, the modern churchianity. The churchianity of the new plastic cross. One of the things they teach you in marriage is define what you want. I want a tall wife. I want one with long leg. I want one who has a this, who has that, who has this, who has that. And they tell women to tell what they want and God will satisfy the desire of the righteous. If you learn that, as they say in Nigeria, fa, 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 foul. You get what you think you want, it may not be who you need. Because marriage is beyond the packaging. The real person is inside. This thing is an earthly tabernacle. It's only for a period of time and you can be deceptive. There are people who look very meek on the outside, but they are lions inside. I mean male and female. Am I right? Okay. So it is better to allow he who knows all things. And when it is time and the Lord tells you, you have no business listening to any man or woman. Don't let anybody talk you out of what the Lord told you. Your persuasion, your conviction. If you allow that to happen, you'll be ruled by what they think. See, so we are starting late today, and I'm going to trust the Lord. I just want to make that brief introduction. Then I'll tell you the 10 pillars in kingdom marriage the Lord revealed to me that if we take heed to them, and, and I trust the Lord, please show me the time, and I'm going to try and take uh, some time so that Pastor Grace will also come and do her own. We really took so much time on food today. Please, next time, let's not do so. Man's life shall not consist of bread alone. <laughs> Am I right? So please, let's package it and make sure we don't spend more than 30 minutes. It's not proper. So pillar number one. Now listen, let me finish reading that place before we give it. And listen, the rib which Elohim had taken from man, made he a woman and brought he unto the man. And Adam, who was asleep, saw this woman. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Take note of that. Taken out of man, woman, the, womb, the man with the womb. So women are not inferior. If anything, they are superior in terms of makeup, in terms of refinement, in terms of capacity. There are many things a woman can do, no man can do it. There's none of us here who can be a who can carry a, a, a child in the womb for nine months. No man can do that. It's not possible. And yet, they can do a job, do business on the side, do ministry. No. So don't think, that weaker vessel, don't be deceived. That weaker simply means the more refined vessel. The one that is more refined and therefore more fragile. The men 
are closer to the edge. That's all the roughness you see. You know, the hoarseness, the coarseness is because we are from the earth. The women were taken from that refinement. Okay, so men, recognize that. You don't lose anything. Amen? He said, 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and there shall be one flesh. Leave father and mother and cleave to your wife. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, this tells you, so please watch the video of Thursday if you were not here. It will give you a good background. Let's now talk about the ten pillars. Number one, Elohim is the author, sustainer, and finisher of the marriage institution. Let me say it again. Elohim is the author, sustainer, and finisher of the marriage institution. And if it is so, then we need to understand that it is very important that whatever marriage that will happen should happen with him and through him. Amen. Elohim. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, And Elohim said, Elohim signifies compound. The God that is us. The three in one. Elohim, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together as one. And together as one. Amen. Elohim. There's something the Lord wants to restore in the earth realm through marriage. It is a concept of unity. Just as you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Lord brings two people together and they say they are now one. What is he teaching? We are better together. Marriage signifies the power of unity. That is why we said on Thursday, marriage brings about a certain thing, a certain shift in our mindset. And if that shift doesn't happen in you, you cannot enjoy marriage. One, we it says us, not me. Can we say us, not me? Can we say we, not I? Can we say ours, not mine? You can't be married and still have your bank account separate from her or him. You can't be married and have your separate estate. You see, in the modern world, they do what they call prenup. Prenup means prenuptial arrangements. Whereby you say, okay, this man has been a celebrity all his life. Oh, this woman is coming to his life. Oh, why should she, if anything happens in one, two years, why should she inherit us? So let's sign an agreement. Let's sign an agreement that everything I brought to the marriage, if this marriage doesn't work, is my own. I go away with it. You don't have any claim to it. You know what? That is the world. You can do that in civil union. It's not a marriage. Because the day marriage occurs, there is a divine miracle that makes two people one. It's no longer about me, it's about us. It's no longer about we, um, I, it's not about we. It's no longer about mine, it's not about ours. If this happens, the marriage will be sustained for a long time. But if it doesn't happen, a room is created for failure. If two people getting in, don't prepare. That's why we say, we'll come to that. If two people don't get in, in, don't receive proper guidance in these matters, they are going to lay landmines that will blow up the marriage. And they'll do it unawares. So Mar Elohim is the author, the sustainer, and the finisher of the marriage institution. He started it. He will sustain it. And he will finish it. Amen. Number two, Elohim is the only matchmaker. In marriage, from a kingdom perspective, there's only one matchmaker, Elohim. I know there are people may say to you, hey, that sister is wonderful, oh, that brother, hey, if you just, if you get to know him, you love him. Now, listen, that's opinion of men. And never ever say to me that you are ruled by that opinion. 
that may kind of open your consciousness. Maybe there's a brother you didn't even know about. Somebody spoke about it. There's something like a scale falls off your eye and you are more aware. Ultimately, if that person is the person that made the match, you have all members miserable. The highest that person did was to open your consciousness. But in reality, there's only one matchmaker. Why? It's only one person who knows the man he created, the woman he created, the one he redeemed, the one he redeemed, he alone knows who fits into the other. So Elohim is the only matchmaker. Listen to this. His match is always perfect because he created. He knows your attitude. And let me say this to you. He doesn't always give you somebody who is of the same ilk like you. As a matter of fact, the matchmaking of Elohim is that he often gives you an opposite. You are dum dum yam yam. You are dum dum and he's yam yam. So when, you, when the two rhyme, they sound good. Dum dum yam yam. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's not always. It's, always. it's not always. There may be some, even where you have some similarities, those similarities, there may be differences in the similarities. For instance, let me give you an example. My wife gave this so I can talk about it. Uh, now, she gave you, she told you one time on this pulpit about, you know, both of us are givers. We are, the Lord gave us a gift of generosity of compassion. As a matter of fact, what we're doing in Global Missions Board is simply an extension of that grace. That's what it is. That's just what it is. It's just an extension of that grace. Apostle Rosalind just brought me something as a blessing for Liberia. And as she was going, the Lord asked me to tell her that thing is going towards one of the projects that is dear to her heart that we are doing. Amen. Now listen to this. My wife, when we got to be married, this was August, 23 years ago. You know what? The church we belong to, the Lord was dealing with me, saying, hey, leave denomination alone. I call you for my kingdom. One of the arguments they gave to my wife on why she should not go forward with that marriage was, you are very generous, you can give everything, and this man is just generosity embodied. Okay, if you go with him, who will restrain the order? That was the argument. Can you imagine religious people? You want to restrain two people from marriage. When you should congratulate them. But the key was this. My wife said something to you, that she is deliberate in her giving. She plans, she plots, and all that. That is beautiful. But I'm spontaneous. As Holy Spirit speaks, so let it be. Because he has taught me to trust him so much so that if he says, take out this coat, give it to this brother right now, so it is because I know that he is supplying three, four, five coats right now. So I don't have time to do the planning and plotting. But she does the deliberate one he plants it, plots it, and all that. It is good grace. And mine is good grace. So we balance each other. Are you hearing me? We balance each other. So Elohim, the point I'm making is the matchmaker. He knows what he puts in this one. He knows what he puts in this one. So he brings it. So don't tell me because you are different personalities. You know these days, they say, oh, uh, we look at our personality. This one is uh, this. This one is that. And that's why we're having problems. No, that's a lie. If the Lord brought you together, that so-called difference in the eyes of man are the very thing that will give the rhyme. Somebody say rhyme. That, that blending, that blending is what you need to discover. If you discover the blending and invest in it, the honest truth is this. You are not going to be irritated by the things that used to irritate you. So I pray that today somebody will be healed. Elohim is the only matchmaker. His matches are perfect because he created both parties. Male and female, he created them in his omniscience 
and omnipresence. He knows them. He knows who fits into each other fulfill purpose. People may introduce yourself before. People may make you aware of somebody. But if Elohim is not in it, they have misled you. And so if it is so, if he's the only matchmaker, listen to this, seek his will. Pursue his will and find his will. Seek, pursue, find. Now let me say something that is interesting. In Christendom, a woman is supposed to be so passive until she is found. But in the kingdom, the Lord may minister to you about the person he has for you. And that ministration may be one year, six months, two years. You may know that you know. The Lord may speak to you. Why? It is wrong to profile women as just attachment. They are sons of Elohim in, male bo in female bodies. Just as the men are sons of Elohim in male bodies. So Elohim can speak to his daughter. He can speak to his son. And if a woman is very spiritual, the Lord can show and even she can go through the process of saying, Lord, confirm it for me. And the Lord can confirm it very clearly. But for purpose of decency, we say to the woman, you don't need to go trying to cut the man. You do not need to go introduce yourself to the man. Cool down. Touch somebody and say, somebody, cool down. Cool down. You can, instead of going to approach or whatever, spend that time in prayer. Pray that God will wake up your Adam. It is a good prayer. It's not a carnal prayer. Lord, wake him up. Because Adam may be sleeping. I was sleeping. Pastor Grace was around me. I knew it not. <laughs> and I went out of sympathy to go and marry somebody. And they gave me permission. I went to Lagos. I took journey. Almost 1,000 mile journey. To go and make a proposal. And thank God for spiritual people. They said, okay, thank you. I reported to the pastor there. And I was given permission. Talked to the lady. And then I was asked to come back after two or three weeks. I went back and she said, I prayed, I don't have confirmation. It's not the will of God. Now you, you will expect that I will be feeling one kind, offended, all that. Listen, that moment when she said it wasn't, as I walked out of that place, a cloud was lifted. The joy of the Lord. I feel that presence of the Lord. I know that I know. And in the state of that overflow, the Lord said, what you are looking for afar is right beside you. And I, did, I knew it not. So at times the Lord can allow you to crash. Yes. If he loves you, to catch your attention. Someone say, catch attention. So Elohim is the only matchmaker. He alone knows who he has brought together for his purpose. And we're going to have a separate lesson, how to know the will of the Lord in marriage. We're going to talk about at least 17 ways you can know that you know that this one is the one the Lord has called into your life. Number three pillar. In the kingdom, fulfilling divine purpose must be the driving force of the marriage institution. Fulfilling the divine purpose. This is so important. So, if it is so, to fulfill the purpose of the Father, it means this. Listen to this. To please Elohim must trump to gratify the flesh. The purpose of marriage is to please the Lord God of heaven. Please take note of that. When he brings people together, he doesn't bring people together to now walk out of his will. No. He doesn't bring people together that the man is now to please the woman. No. You see Pastor Chris right there and Mr. Beatrice, the day he married her, it is not for him now to now find a new God called Beatrice to please. No. No. 
Neither is it for Mr. Beatrice to find a new God called Pastor Chris to please. No. This is the problem of religion. Religion has made it in many places when you go to marriage seminar. If it's a man, if it's a, a, a how do you call it, um, a, um, a chauvinistic uh, speaker, he will, he will present it all as the woman is there to just please the man. He was taken from her side and her job is just to make her happy. If he's a feminist speaker, he will think that the man, all your job, all your life is now to seek to pursue this woman, to seek to please her, to make her happy so that she can give you what you want. These things are all trash. Marriage is not about two people. There are three personalities in marriage. Elohim is at the pinnacle. It's like a, a pinnacle, a triangle. Elohim is at the pinnacle. And the man is here, the woman is there. Both of them are seeking to please him. It is in seeking to please him that you find him. It is in speaking to please him that you find her. And both of us are now, our goal, our purpose, our drive is to please Elohim. Once you make that transition that is about pleasing Elohim, the question is not what to do to make the man happy or the woman happy. It is what shall we do to make the God of heaven please with us? Are you hearing me? And it looks easy as I'm talking it, but the truth is that this is the major problem, the root of all problems. Because in modern day presentations of marriage, it is about a husband making the wife his idol and a wife making the husband her idol. Listen, anything that displaces Elohim as number one in your life is an idol. So if you have to do something to please the woman, even when God says otherwise, even when God makes known his will contrary to what she wants, she has displaced Elohim as the God of your life. And the moment that happens, you have an idol, not a graven image, but something that is living and breathing right in your home. Amen and brethren, every marriage, every couple must renounce the tendency to make an idol of the other party. It should be done willingly. Someone say willingly. It should be done without struggle. Someone say without struggle. It should be renounced. A wife is not living at the, for the pleasure of the woman. A woman is not living for the pleasure of the man. They too are for the pleasure of the Most High. If that is established, that marriage will stand. If that is established, it will please Elohim. If that is established, it will be the ground of a new culture. Amen. And so having said that, men and brethren, I'd like to say number four pillar, if we are going to make, if we are going to have marriages that work, we must renounce worldly cultural perspectives. Can we say worldly cultural perspectives must be renounced? Amen. Now you know what it means? You must renounce, for instance, if you are, say, an Igbo from Eastern Nigeria, you must renounce the caste system. The Igbos have a caste system. It's not often announced. People know about the one of India. But the caste system says some people are Osu, some people are Ume, and then some people are Madiala. And then in some villages, you can marry somebody from another caste. You must renounce it. If you don't renounce it, then your marriage is void of no effect. You must also renounce racial or ethnic animus. There's what we call racial or ethnic animus or national animus. For instance, Nigeria and the Ghana, they are perpetual competitors. In football, Nigeria will beat Ghana. Ghana will never rest until it beats Nigeria. And Nigeria will never rest until they beat Ghana. Politically, their independence was three years apart. The, Ghana is the black star of Africa. Nigeria is the largest democracy of Africa. They are always in perpetual competition. Now, if you want to marry, if you carry that national animus, you miss God's plan. 
Does that make sense? Or maybe you have been taught all your life, hey, white people, white people, they are this. Chinese people, they are this. Oh, black people, they are this. And you carry that in your bloodstream. And you now make up your mind, oh, I'm going to marry someone from my ethnic group. Already you have missed the road. Because once you have defined those you don't want, and those you want, you have played Elohim. You are playing Elohim. Does that make sense? So we must renounce tribal or ethnic or racial perspectives of marriage. When we renounce them, then we are set for we are set for the Lord. In other words, the Lord wants us to have an open mind. For those who have not gone in, have an open mind. Because the one the Lord has for you may be from another ethnic group, may be from another tribal group, may be from another racial group, may be. Listen, and this thing we are talking is not just renouncing worldly um, and cultural case system and all that or animals. You must also renounce all the old cultural system. The cultural system tells you that a man should be like three, four, five, six years older than the man before they marry. Who told you that one? Where did it come from? It's from culture of humans. Listen to this. A man may be the same age as his wife. For another person, what will work, the Lord knows it, is that the man is 10 years more older than his wife. And that's the word the Lord will work. For another person, there's a man who has a destiny. But that destiny is so precious to the Lord that if his age mate comes into his life, two of them will mess it up. And so the Lord will give her, him somebody who is older than him, more matured, who has the ability to see the grace of the Lord and pay the price for that grace to be channeled. So you don't allow human um, uh, uh, ideologies to come into the issue of marriage. He alone knows the match. I hope you all understanding me. He alone knows who in your life will make you complete. Amen? And we need to come to that place where we truly are free of all these cultural attachments. That's why strongholds in the mind must be pulled down. The Lord knows who he has given to you and he knows who will make it complete. Number five. Now let's go on back to what we're saying. The three main parties to a kingdom marriage are Elohim first at the pinnacle of the triangle. I said that before, but I want to explain it now. The three main parties to a marriage is Elohim at the pinnacle. If, you know, what I mean by a pinnacle is, if, if I had a, a chalk to draw here, this is a triangle, okay, a triangle, three-sided figure. The peak, like a mountain, that's Elohim. Here at the base is the man, here at the base is the woman, now, these are the three main parties to a marriage. Listen to this, and this is important. The children are not part of the marriage. The children are fruit and blessings of the marriage. They are not part of the marriage. Are you hearing me? And for those of you from Africa, listen to me. The idea that when a man and a woman marries... They are okay, sweetie, honey, having all the good time, having all the, you know, intimate time. The moment children come, children displace daddy. Children displace mommy. In some cultures, once a man has got a, <laughs> once a man has got a son, the woman's purpose has been fulfilled. His whole life is now on that son. Oh, my son. The son is having a headache and wife is having stomach problem. His eyes on the son. All those village mentality. Children are not part of the marriage. Tell your neighbor. Children are blessings and fruit. They are not part of the marriage. Amen. It's not only that. Listen to this. Don't allow your children to get in between you as a couple. Couples here, hear me. Don't allow your children to get in between. The idea that because you now have children, they are growing. There's no more time of, you know, intimacy and all that. Everything is now stiff and official. It is a terrible thing. And it should be rejected. 
Parents are not part of marriage. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. Parents are not part. But then we don't throw them away. We don't throw them the parents away because they are not part. No, they are added responsibility. Why? They invested in you and took you to the place where you are now, you know, a man, you are now a woman. Don't throw them away. They are responsibility. Take care of them, but take care of them mutually. Don't have age parents and you are comfortable and you are in London, you are in New York, you are eating well and taking care, then your age parents in Africa or the Caribbean is suffering. No, don't allow that to happen. But at the same time, you must leave them. If you don't leave them, marriage will not work. Amen? You must do what? Leave them. It's your own. It's the beginning of a new family. Siblings and other relatives are not part of the marriage. They are part of the extended family. And the extended family should be dealt with equally. In other words, don't have a different standard for your own relatives, your own siblings, and other standard for uh, siblings of your spouse. No. It should be standard of the couple. The couple should sit down and discuss how do we support, how do we bless our siblings, our siblings. Your, the siblings of the man are the siblings of the wife. And the siblings of the wife are siblings of the man. Do we understand, brethren? This is so important. The Bible says in Genesis, for this cause shall a man. It's not only the man. If you're a woman and say, well, the Bible says for this cause a man. And then you, you have your own little, um, what do you call them, piggy bank. Every time there's some family money, you spend 25 pounds, you put 5 pounds there. The man doesn't know. You spend 30 pounds, you put 20 pounds there, he doesn't know. And then when he acts up, you secretly go to Western Union and transmit it to your mom. No, it's not allowed. Do you understand? It's not allowed both ways. The responsibility should be mutual. We receive it. You discuss it. Let nobody block goodness, but it should be discussed. Amen? And two of you should agree on what to do. Number six. Spiritual and physical maturity should precede marriage. It is not for boys, it's not for girls, it's for adults. Spiritual and physical maturity. If somebody is, say, 25 years, but emotionally unstable, emotionally 12 years old, you must check both things before you go into marriage. Because the emotional instability and immaturity will not be solved by marriage. It, it will actually be blown up by marriage. Does that make sense? So there has to be spiritual and physical maturity. It's for the good of all. When there's emotional maturity and you're able to handle things without blowing up, without losing it, and without you know, destroying things, you can handle relationship. If one is still in the basis where once you are angry, you throw a tantrum, you are ready to burn the bridges and all that, it's going to cause problem in marriage. Because the person you are going to be with doing that with is not going to be far, it's near. And so for this reason, men and brethren, number seven, take note of number seven. The greatest preparation for marriage is sanctification of the heart by Holy Spirit through the word and the blood. The greatest preparation for marriage is sanctification of the heart by Holy Spirit through the word and the blood. And this is preceded by strong desire and persistent prayer 
strong desire, persistent prayer in faith. Let's read the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I pray the Lord is going to do something in the midst of all his people. Those online and those who are here. Listen to me. Even for those who are married, if you're already married, the key to enjoy rather than endure the marriage is sanctification. Sanctification is a work of grace in which the Lord pierces through to locate the stony heart, the Adamic nature, from where all the problems have, all the hatred, all the animosity, all the negativity, they proceed from the Adamic nature. And so if people want to marry and they really want to go through proper counseling, one of the things they should go through is an invitation to encounter the Lord afresh. Where the Lord roots out Adam and replaces with the nature of Yeshua, the new nature. First Thessalonians chapter 5 from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain. Now listen. What is an appearance of evil? An appearance of evil, he called him appearance. He didn't say it's evil. Okay, that means a brother and a sister who want to get married, they must take note that at some point, the enemy will suggest to them that because you have agreed to get married, it's okay. It's okay to visit each other. It's okay to do certain things. It's okay. It's okay, you know, to, to, to respond. Let's say, oh, okay, uh, this person wants to marry you. Um, you hear the person is not well. Appearance of evil is to visit that person at a wrong time. What is the wrong time? 8 p.m. is the wrong time. 7 p.m. in certain weather is the wrong time. 6 p.m. is the wrong time in certain weather. It's a, it's a wrong thing. It's an appearance of evil to visit somebody in a home all alone and the people around who are unbelievers seeing that brother or sister go into that home not knowing that it's just to go and console somebody or pray with somebody. They are taught. The enemy lets them think that what's going on is what they do as unbelievers automatically that shuts down the ministry of the brother or sister around where he lives. Because those who went, saw that person going in, tomorrow you want to preach to them, they are looking at you as a hypocrite. Meanwhile, you may not have done anything wrong. But it's an appearance of evil. You can make somebody to stumble. That visitation can make somebody who is an unbeliever never to believe Christians. So it's an appearance of evil to visit except under certain conditions, including mature companion who went with that person to do the prayer under permission. You don't do things secretive. You don't do things that may create an image crisis for the body. You see, the more we grow, the more we seek the glory of the Lord. We seek to please the Lord. And whatever that will not please him, we make sure we do not allow it. Sanctification. He said, it starts with you. Abstain. He said, listen, there are things you can do yourself. The things you can keep away yourself. Keep away from those things. Restrain yourself. When the enemy wants to come, restrain. Whatever that has an appearance of evil, keep it out of you. Then he says, Verse 23, and the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, Elohim, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Yeshua. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Sanctification is done by Elohim by his spirit. Through the ministry of the word. We are told in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12 and 13. The word of Elohim is quick and sharp. And powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. It can pierce through. And deliver you from every stony situation. Every unholy thing. It can locate it and take it away. So. Everyone who wants to go into marriage. And those who are in marriage. What, if you are in marriage already. And there are issues in your marriage. Go 
Instead of blaming the other party, go to the Lord to do a work in you. It's a second work of grace. Say, Lord, I surrender my heart for sanctification. When sanctification happens, your life is different. If you are an intended, if you are single, you intend to get into marriage, don't ever go into marriage until you are sanctified. Because when you are sanctified, there are two main outcomes. Number one is when the old man, the stony heart is taken away, you are able to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind. You are able to love other people like yourself, including the one who is going to be your spouse. Sanctification also achieves another purpose. It enables you to have the spirit of unity with the people the Lord has connected you with, including the married partner. Sanctification does a work. It gives you the ability on what Peter said in 1 Peter 4 verse 8, the love that covers multitude of sins. Most of the time, the problem in marriage is not what somebody did or didn't do. It is a reaction to what somebody did or didn't do. It's a reaction of, some, of what somebody said or didn't say. So, the Lord says in the book of um, Galatians chapter 6, that the one who is stronger in faith will be the one the Lord looks upon to restore the weaker. So, supposing your spouse says something hurtful to you, that thing he said or she said, the Lord is not, the Lord is watching you more than he or her. What do you make of it? What do you make of the issue, that word is what would define whether the relationship be broken or whether the bridge can be repaired. And so when there is sanctification, you can forgive quickly. When there is, uh, when there is sanctification, you can forgive forward. When there's sanctification, you can make some deep decisions. Decisions that are so deep, so profoundly deep, that people will think you are even a fool, but you know it's because of the Lord. And part of it is that you will not criticize your spouse before your family, before your parents, before your siblings. You are not going to criticize her. You are not going to, you know, report her. You are not going to dishonor her. You are going to build her up and stand with her or stand with him it takes a sanctified heart to, to take an insult and in spite of the insult still love when your heart is sanctified you can actually manage the most difficult of people like Nabal Abigail managed him until he left and in the, on the last day, Abigail in the Old Testament will stand in judgment against believers. The Bible didn't say, listen, let's say you married as unbelievers. After some time, you met the Lord. You are now a believer. Your husband is not. Your wife is not. Did the Bible say you should leave her? No. The Bible says there's grace. There's grace. If that person is willing there's grace to be able to endure. So sanctification will make it. Sanctification will make you, you are not looking at somebody's faults, you are looking at the possibilities. Sanctification will open your eyes to look at somebody from the point of view of Elohim, God's eyes. Sanctification is so necessary. If there's something that is missing so strongly in the body today that the Lord wants to restore, it is sanctification. If sanctification returns in the household of the Lord, we are going to have a lot of easy. There is going to be a lot of healings in marriage. What we have today is somebody does something, the other one counter punches. Nobody is willing to bear. Nobody is willing to help. Nobody is willing to pay the price of recovery. People are burning the bridge. Small thing, they are burning the bridge. Supposing you decide that the Lord has made you the savior of that marriage. You decide to be the Jesus Christ of that marriage. You become the one that be the burden bearer. In the modern world, they don't teach you these things. They teach you, no, 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 no. I can't stand it. You know that? Men, you go to Babylon Salon, all you hear is that women are wicked, are evil. 
women, you go to a hair salon. All you hear from the day you step in till the time they are walking on your hair is all men. Women are wicked. Men are evil. Listen, the time has come to be radical. Anywhere you go and people speak evil of what you are part of, get out of there. If your feet will lead you to hell, Jesus says better, cut off one feet that you go into the eternal estate without one leg than to have two legs and end up in hell. You don't go. You don't go among people. All they are doing is speaking evil of your, your, your spouse or, your, or the institution you believe in because they don't believe in it. And don't make yourself a partaker of their sin. Number eight, in kingdom culture, Intending couples do courtship rather than dating. In kingdom culture, intending couples do courtship rather than what? Dating. Dating is a worldly concept. Dating loosens the flesh. Dating often leads to sin. The sin of premarital sex, which is evil in the sight of Elohim. Today, people have counted it as nothing. Dating is evil. It is not for Christians. We do courtship. What is courtship? Courtship is a process whereby an intending couple are led by Holy Spirit through guidance of their pastors or other leaders to prayerfully and systematically discover the true identities of each other. They are led by Holy Spirit under the guidance and leadership of their leaders to discover the true identities of each other. Discover the aspirations in each other. Discover the deficiencies in each other in order to make an informed decision whether to proceed or not. Amen? Whether to do what? Proceed or not. Now listen to this. Men and brethren, it is a terrible thing that today many Christians are encouraged in the name of marriage, the pressures of marriage, so that will answer Mr. and Mrs. And people are just under pressure. They met somebody in a nightclub. You give them a chance, the next month they are married. They met somebody in a Christian festival. Hey, the person wore a perfume that attracted their nose, that hit their nose, nostrils. And before they know it, three months later they are married. Now, you know what? That is a recipe for disaster. The Lord wants people who are intending in marriage to spend a minimum of six months. Not too long. Not to one year, two years courtship. No. If you drag it too long, it is not good. But about six months of intensive, organized, systematic discovery of each other, discovery of aspirations, of ambitions, a discovery of expectations and vision, and then asking yourself a question. Because during this period, listen to this, why courtship should extend for some period of time? When you meet a woman or a man you think you love, you want to marry, there's always a theme. You know that theme? It's called love covers a multitude of evil. At that stage, you won't see anything in that person. All you are seeing is stars and moon and, and, and all those things. You know, you are, you are on a roll. You can't see, you can't know for at least the first two months. It's in the third month. In, in the first two months, every appointment, every appointment they are keeping it. It's in the third month that you begin to see things like you had an appointment, you are going to talk by five o uh, 3 o'clock, 3.30. The brother has not shown up. The star has not showed up. And when he comes, he do as if nothing happened. Then the Lord allows that to test you. It tests you. What is your reaction to that? How is your response to that? And then, are you able to honestly talk about it without feeling fearful that this may close the marriage? And so that is why the six months period is to provide opportunity for conversations led by Holy Spirit, guided by leaders, so that in the process of that, and we're going to have a full teaching on courtship, you know, on what should be done in courtship, in the process, people are able to ask themselves questions. You are going to see impatience in a man. Can you carry? You are going to see temper in a woman. Can you carry? 
those things are vital questions that you ask yourself so that you can honestly go before the Lord. If you need the Lord to do a work in that person, begin to pray about it. But more importantly, pray about your own reaction. By the time you go through that process, when marriage comes, you can hardly be overtaken because the capacity is there to make sure that you can go forward. Amen. Now, courtship should not be conducted anywhere. Conversations of courtship should be conducted in spiritually, you know, conducive environments. What, are, what do we mean? We mean homes of married couples where you have children or, you know, where it's not too private for the enemy to enter anybody's, but yet having enough space for the two people to meet and talk. It should also be conducted in places like church buildings, inside the church buildings, or public places like, you know, uh, libraries, or even in some areas, like during summer, like in public parks, where people can sit and talk. Amen? Does that make sense? In other words, in kingdom culture, intending couples should do courtship. And it also shows whether they are subject to authority. Anything you do on earth that is not subject to authority is faulty in the kingdom. Because the kingdom is a kingdom based on authority. Liberty and order. There's a balance. If you ignore the balance of authority, your liberty will lead to sin. And it's very easy for liberty to lead to sin. Number nine. If marriage will work and please the Lord, premarital sexual relationships are forbidden by the constitution of the kingdom. And that includes lust. Lust. Lusting for each other. Includes bodily contact. Includes kissing. Includes other things that inflame passion. They should be kept away. And listen, that's how you know whether the people are truly called by the Lord. The ability to prayerfully, respectfully, knowing that the omniscient Elohim is watching, the omnipresent Elohim is right there, the ability to conduct these things without messing up is so critical. So it's so important that we know that the Lord wants us. If you look at Matthew 5, you read it, the Lord hates, the Lord doesn't encourage anything, lusting after or touching or doing anything that dishonors him. The Lord says no to that in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. And I pray all of you, if you have questions, Pastor Grace has given me right away to just finish this teaching today. If you have questions, you are online, write them down. Minister Gozier, who is head of media department, will be able to write it down. And if you are in the class here, you have a question, you can write it down and Mr. Gozier will pick it up and give you the microphone and you ask your questions. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. The whoremongers and adulterers Elohim will judge. Marriage is honorable in all. Marriage is honorable. It's an honorable institution. And the Lord said preserve the honor. Preserve the glory. The glory is that the Lord will show you somebody who is your partner and for six months or whatever period of time of courtship, you preserve the purity of each other. You preserve the chastity of each other so that on the day of marriage, then you have legal permission to gain access to each other. Until then, the ability to be under authority and not be inflamed by passion, it shows that one is truly in the will of the Father. When this is dishonored, somebody can get into a situation where people do what they shouldn't do. And when that happens, the Bible says, whoremongers. Elohim regards such people as whoremongers. It's in a way, a tea is trading in flesh. And they say God will judge. And that judgment may include the Lord taking away the peace of that marriage and that foundation becomes faulty and faulty and never able to stabilize. And it could be judgment. If going into a marriage, people don't honor the Lord and don't uh, respect him, the Lord can turn his back. And two people can be physically married, but 
truly they are not married. And the foundation could be that act or acts of immorality before marriage. And the Lord wants us to know these things because he wants us to, pre he wants to prepare us for the perfection of the church before the law returns. Church without spot, church without wrinkle, or that such thing. Number 10, marriage is union for life. Marriage is union for life. Men and brethren, let's not allow people to deceive us with their newfound wisdom of the new plastic cross. The new plastic cross tells you that you can pick up anybody and when she doesn't please, you can drop her or drop him. That is carnal. That is worldly. If you agree with those things, you miss it. In the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 16, for the Lord, the Elohim of Israel said that he hated putting away for one covering violence with his garment, said the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirits that you deal not treacherously. He hates putting away. Elohim hates divorce. No amount of modernism can change the reality. He hates it. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, Yeshua encounters some people who ask him a question. Now I want to say this is so important. The book of Matthew chapter 5, from verse 31 to 32, it had been said, whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That's the Old Testament. Whoever wants to put away his wife, just give her a letter so that she's freed of you and she can sort out her future. Verse 32. The king of kings, the prince of life says, But I say unto you that whoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. We are going to come to these things in the course of the teaching to see what we call the exclusion clause. But we need to know that marriage is a union and is for life. The idea you can put away and take another person, it is a carnal thing. Men and brethren, listen to Matthew chapter 19. Yeshua also had an encounter with the people and they asked him some questions. Matthew 19. Verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore Elohim had joined together, let no man put asunder. They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, listen to this, how divorce came in, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. Genesis chapter 2, it was not so. But I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed what? Adultery. And whoever married a child which is put away, doth commit what? Adultery. And the disciples said unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is good, not good to marry. He said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying. Save them to whom it is given. For there are some, eunuchs, which are so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs, which were made eunuchs of men. And there are eunuchs, which, are made eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So the Lord, the disciples say, ah, if you cannot put away your wife, then this is a very tough thing. This is a very tough thing. It's better not to marry. And I'll say, hey, if you don't want to marry, let it be that you have grace. 
for the father. Or you have deliberately and consciously made yourself a eunuch. Now, the law doesn't want divorce. And so, he is not part of the worldly culture of picking and dropping partners where there is a breakdown in relationships. It's either Elohim was not involved or both people strayed away from his will. So what are the remedies to avoid that situation? If there is a situation where things are broken down, and let's say a woman's life is in danger, or a man's life is in danger, the man has a knife somewhere, or a gun somewhere, and there's fear, and there's danger to life, there can be temporary separation if there's a danger to life. If there's potential of assault and battery, and one may be hurt, there can be temporary separation. And that is supervised by the leadership the people submit to. Number two, mediation by the pastor or married couples in the case of people whose relationship has broken down. Number three, we need to know it's not the will of the father for people to drop their spouses and go to marry others. Now the question will be, what of those who have, for reasons that is not really their fault or their plan, let's say when they were single, they got into relationships that are not marriage and they had children and all that. What about them? The reality is, if they were not married, they are still single. If they are not married, they are what? Single. If those relationships were, let's say, you know, the normal things people do in the world and then they just have children, that does not preclude them from the marriage institution if they were not married. And nobody can judge them as married people just because they have children. And the Lord wants us to know. This course is going to be detailed. What we have just done on Thursday and today is introduction. We are going to be delving into this because there's an epidemic, especially in the Western world. It's been Africa. It has touched Africa. Uh, the other day I saw a, a newscast that a, a pastor in Ghana, a very popular one, is making, laying the foundation for uh, a, what they call it, polygamy. He was talking about how he admires the impala. He's told that impala, the animal, has 70 wives or so. And he was celebrating it. And the people were discussing that this man is laying the foundation for where people can just have as many wives as they have. So in Africa, the foundation is broken. And the Lord wants to prepare us. He wants to repair things. We are going to have detailed discussion. We are not going to rush it. You know this is the anniversary month of the Global School of Ministry. The Lord wants to expand this course. And the Lord wants to really give us a good background. Because if the foundation be broken, what shall the righteous do? We need to know that the Father has a plan to repair that which is wrong. It starts with knowledge of truth. You shall know the truth. The truth shall do what? Set you free. Don't be presumptuous in marriage. Don't ever behave as if the Lord is not there. Don't ever behave as if the Lord doesn't see or doesn't know. He sees our heart and mind. And he wants those who are going to go into marriage, go in with a pure heart. Be subject to authority. Listen to the authority the Lord put over. You, don't, you can't be married. Okay, you can't be going to church. You, are, you have somebody God is in to build you up. Suddenly, you're about to wed. You, I mean, you say you have found somebody. Now, the pastor is no longer qualified to tell you the truth. You go to look for a pastor for yourself. You know what? It's craftiness. It's what? Craftiness. Because the one the Lord puts over you is a legitimate authority. The one you went to find for yourself is an illegitimate authority. Any counsel given is given for the belly. It's given for what they will get. And they are meddling with fire. We're going to take some questions now before we pray. Any question any one of you have on any of these 10 points, please feel free to ask a question. Some of the things we're going to deal with in detail uh, some of them, Pastor Grace is going to come. For instance, the guidance on what to do during courtship. The Lord will, over the past several years, as we have been counseling, intending couples, we have developed a curriculum where people, what they will go through. Pastor Grace will teach it one of these days. And, you know, it's for good. Any question? On any matter? Online? Class? Or here? 
Okay, okay. Oh, Miss Alinda, Teacher Linda. Yes, you can ask. age is very likely for me to be a second wife and I'm rejecting this all the time but it's con she's constantly bringing it up and I said last week I got so angry with her I said is there anything that my God cannot do am I serving a God that cannot have somebody that's never been married because my views on the matter is God's view on it so um, I just want to ask about that should I just, because she was saying to me, certain pastor said, some of the times we're in the church waiting for husbands and our husbands could be in the gutter, we should bring men into the church to be cleaned up. And I totally reject that. I said, God is able. So should a Christian go out there and find woman, man or whatever to bring in the church? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Simply because of age, you know? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. Now listen, it is... Marriage and Tyler, as we saw today, Elohim is a matchmaker. But I need to say something. The one Elohim has for us is unknown. In the first place, it's a religious mindset that says our spouse is within the church where we are. It's a religious mindset. The spouse of somebody at any given time is where you don't know. Are you understanding me? So the, the pastor may have some insight unfortunately may be twisted for instance to tell a brother or sister say go and evangelize there are people who the lord may have for you they are not in the kingdom right now but by divine election they are for you so as you evangelize you don't know how you are adding to the stock of brothers or sisters in the church that is correct that is true but trying to now put it to you that you in your own case and the bowel of mercy is short then that is wrong. And don't let that person come speaking it. Once you notice that, then shut down that conversation because if you keep allowing that voice to come into you, you know what? It, it, be, it brings an impartation in you. But again, don't say, my God is so good, he has to give me only somebody he's already ready made. The Lord may say, hey, Linda, I've made you a, a person mature, able to uh, you know, help as a pillar for people to stand and it may bring somebody who is, you know, younger in age and younger in the kingdom because there's grace in you to, to nurture that person into destiny. That is possible. But we're not saying that's your case, but it is possible because of the hypothetical situation you raised. It is possible for the Lord to give a woman who is mature, stable, strong, you know, who is able to shepherd things. Somebody who the, the sister will now enable, empower, encourage, and strengthen into destiny. That is possible. Do we understand what we're saying? Amen. Praise the Lord. But don't let somebody speak to you that way. Uh, Pastor Chris. In modern society, um, we, people watch things like Love Island, Big Brother, and these are shaping the mind of the Christian families instead of the world. So it's to discourage our families from engaging in those things that set their mind in the wrong concept of marriage. Because once a child is listening to Big Brother and Love Island, where they're actually making love on the TV set without any standard, um, Bible standard, it, it puts us in a position where we are struggling to teach them because they are now being fed by the world about what marriage is. So by the time they get to marriage, they're already defiled and, and everything is already on the wrong track. That's right. That's correct. And listen, men and brethren, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of Father is not in him. 
Christians should not be feeding themselves with all this Bollywood and Nollywood and Hollywood. Those things are for the world. Because the eye gate is precious. If you feed the eye gate and the ear gate with negative things, they can latch in. Even lust can, can come into people by what people watch on television. You must be discriminating. Don't take garbage because it's like the mind, it can be garbage in, garbage out. Make sure as a Christian you set godly standards in your home concerning what your people can watch and what they cannot watch. Because as Pastor Chris said, what you see, what you see on television can shape your perspectives. And it can make people impossible to ever do things the kingdom way. Amen? So please be careful. Mind what you watch. All of you love those Nigerian movies where all people are doing is all the old ways, all the old things where women go to magicians to go and do potions to influence their husbands. You know that those things can affect you. So be careful what you expose your eyes to. Any, any other one? Um, from the internet. Number one, it says, what should one do when she got married and got divorced and when every time they try to be in a relationship, it fails? And what should one do is stay separate and consecrated to the Lord. Don't hop from people to people. Stay unto the Lord. Be a vessel. Be married to the Lord Yeshua. Be married. And if there's any specific circumstance concerning that marriage uh, that failed, discuss with a pastor who believes in the world to know what he says, whether the exclusion clause applies to you. Otherwise, when you allow it to crash, you are to now be married unto the Lord, holy unto him, an instrument through which he can affect the world. And let nobody talk you into marriage that only married people can fulfill destiny. No, single people can fulfill destiny. Better make sure that at the end of the day, don't be in material breach of any holy word of the Lord. If the Lord said divorce is evil, it is evil. And if you, like I said, meet with a pastor or contact Pastor Grace and we can set up a, a conversation with you to know the exact. There are things you don't give people advice on a public forum like this because you don't know the particular circumstance. Amen? Yes, let, can we take this next one? The second one says, it's me. So what about people who had multiple marriages and divorce before they came to the truth? In what way? Came to the truth, is it? Because they, they now got to a place where they are told the truth or they were Christians all this while. Again, this is, a, this is not a question we can give an answer lest we mislead anyone. Can you please just send us a message and let's set up a conversation with you? Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We are talking about eternity. The Lord is coming soon. If what will make you miss eternity is a relationship you took yourself into and the Lord is not in it, or a relationship outside his will, outside the pillars he has described here, I will say to you, keep eternity in focus. Come to that place where you value your eternal destiny to the degree that you don't want to compromise it for any reason under the sun. Amen? The rewards in the hereafter are much bigger and much better. Is there any other question? Yes. Praise God. Um, my question is, uh, I've got this friend um, who is a minister of God. And um, the husband left her after that over 10 years marriage because she couldn't uh, have a child for him. He's a minister as well. And then uh, he eventually went out and... Um, had children with this other woman that's got like three other children from different men. And um, she's that child of God that really, you know, she's holding on to her marriage and the word of God. She doesn't believe in, you know, divorce. And we've been praying over this for years now, believing that God will touch the man to come back. Um, each time she tried to find out what is happening there, which, you know, a few years ago, realized she had another child again for him. Only last year, they went ahead to wed. So, 
you know, that kind of thing has left her in a state that what is her fate? Will she continue to be waiting for him while we're praying and they're progressing in their relationship? And um, she strongly stands against divorce. So sometimes when she presents those questions to me, it becomes so difficult. I don't even know what to answer again. I just keep telling her, let's keep praying. But I want to use this opportunity to ask this question. What way forward for that sister? Okay. Pastor Grace, you want to take that? Okay. Somebody give, him, give her the microphone. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, just a few things I wanted to say before I come in there. Um, Mr. Um, Linda, there's no age barrier. Being 53 or not being 53, if the Lord has kept someone for you, the Lord has kept someone and he will come. So let no one tell you that 53 is um, what happens. There's, there, there's so many of them out there. Just as you're saying, Lord, they're also telling that man, oh, you're 53. Who else do you think will marry you? So man cannot and will not. The Lord knows. Amen. So that is neither here nor there, number one. Another one is that somebody asks on the net and says, before I know the truth, an apostle says, we want to know which one is the truth because truth means a lot of things to some people. To some people, when they find another man, they said, no, I know the truth. So we don't know if that's what you mean. But if knowing the truth is knowing the word of Elohim that you shouldn't, you've done it. It's just like John chapter 4, the, the woman of Samaria. Jesus said to her, the one you're living with now is not even your husband. So, and he ran and said, see, who told me who I am? So our reaction should be that of that lady. And then we've known the truth and it will set us free. Amen. In the days of ignorance, God winks at. Now we've known the truth. Let's, carry, let's just carry on with the Lord and don't go back again. It's quite very messy to be with man one, man two, man three, man four. Actually, it's prostitution of another language. How can you do that? But if we've done it in ignorance, God will insert it. It was in ignorance. Now we've known the truth no more. Amen. Amen. Concerning the sister that you've just said, and then um, both of them are ministers. You know, these days, brethren, a lot of people teach whatsoever they want to teach. Because some in the scriptures are giving some, in, on the television has said a lot of things. If she's genuinely married to that man, and then um, they have children, and he keeps going and comes back. Is that true? He doesn't have a child, but the man keeps going and then keeps coming. Marriage is still marriage. Amen. There should not be any divorce because we said for better or for worse. And this is the worst. And sometimes worse can be worst. And worst can be if there's any other ex. And XXS, you want to add to it. And then God will give the grace and the patience to stay. Because if he leaves that man and then go, and the man has got one or two other children elsewhere, and now. That's it. No, because and you, the man has divorced her now. She keep progressing. He's putting the divorce again. He's divorced her. That's fine. Then what's, her, what's her fate now? Okay, what's her fate is that Apostle said it earlier. Jesus said, okay, because of the hardness of our heart, okay, that's why he has allowed us to do divorce. Is God has made, made us, if the man have decided, you know, because he didn't have a child, Children are blessings and fruit of the marriage, but not part of the marriage. It's the ignorance and disobedience on the side of the man. And then two, will I, because the man had chosen to go outside the will of God and do what the Lord has, you know, I what, do what God doesn't want us to do, do I, because of him, do the same? Brethren, we should look after our spiritual life. That the man has decided to take to the left should not mean that I, too, should take to the left. I will stand on the right. Hallelujah. And if the man has decided because she doesn't have a child, no problem. Let her be married to the Lord. Okay? If he has decided to go, let the Bible says if the unbeliever depart, let him do what? Depart. 
and you allow him to go. But the sister should wholly give herself to the Lord to serve father. And even in the physical sense, he will ask if she, people may say, oh, go marry another person. If she goes to the second person and there's still no child, what happens? Did you see that? The third child. So in that case, the word of God is the word of God. There are a lot of single sisters, a lot of single brothers. There are a lot of singles who are serving the Lord in power and in spirit and in truth. So there's nothing that says without a man, a woman cannot fulfill ministry or fulfill her life. So if the man has decided after knowing the truth to fall out of faith, to keep committing sin, let him carry on. Hallelujah. And that the sister encourage her, okay, to stay on to the Lord because Jesus is coming soon. Because in heaven there's nothing like husband or wife. There are those who are single. There are those who are not married at all. There are those the Lord has not allowed. And they are serving God in spirit and in truth. Than saying, okay, what is my faith? A lot of people will say, oh, marry another person. He's gone. What's the guarantee that you are not going to face another that again? And then by the time you leave him and leave him and leave him, I can't, brethren, check if it is clean in the sight of God to hop from one man to the other. It's very dirty. May the Lord help us. Okay, thank you. So let me add to that, Stan uh, Pastor Grace has make a, made a very important point. The man is a pastor. He chose to sweep away the word and to despise the Lord because that's the Lord he despised. To despise the Lord and say because she didn't give him a child, he went on to commit sin, commit immorality, and now to compound it, chase her away, say he has bought him, Encourage the sister to remain steadfast and hold on to the Lord. The Lord is still able to do it. The Lord can recover that soul. The Lord has been known to recover people after 10, 15, 20 years. The Lord can still recover and let her mind her soul. Let her actually intercede for this man because the man is caught in real depth of damnation by the choices he has made. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, Chapter 22, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Encourage your friend to be holy still. To not to allow bitterness and anger and offense, but to keep praying and praying he is her husband in the sight of the Lord. Even though he has exercised his way, let her trust the Lord and meanwhile be fully married to the Lord and the Lord can use her to do extraordinary things. Amen? But that's not the way anybody should go. People should not despise the king of kings. Amen. Any final question before we pray? Okay. Uh, Mr. Helen. Is there any other person? From the, uh, from the line. Mr. The Helen, please. Then you can, the you can organize the other one after she finishes, you know. Um, so sometimes it can be quite messy. So say, for instance, if you have a husband and wife who had no children and they divorced, each have gone their separate ways and got married and have children. So do you scatter the two families and two of them come back together? Or would it, better, would, would it be better for both of them to ask the Lord to forgive them because they, they, for what they have done in the past and carry on with their existing marriages? <laughs> that one is another theology. <laughs> it's another theology. But the only theology we know is the Bible, though. The man, a man or woman who is in material breach the only thing is called is repentance and restitution. When you repent, you restitute. And if it's about those children who are fruit of those illegitimate relationships, the Lord can take care. He can give them wisdom, and they can take care of those children. Or the release one said to the other one who was a sin partner, but both of them, if they want to make it, if they don't want anything, stand before them, because obedience is not an option. Obedience is, you see, there's a lot, of, a lot of messing up of the marriage institution to the degree that truth now has fallen on the ground. But what we are going back to is the word. What does the word say? Amen? Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. 
Pastor um, Norbert. It says, um, should a prophet or pastor tell you who to marry? The answer is no. It's wrong. It's control. The control. Pastor can know. Prophet can know. Prophet can know. Can be can know. And if the if the prophet is disciplined, he shouldn't go declaring it. Amen. And uh, in some cases, the Lord may permit a prophet to even share it with one of the people. He shouldn't go to share with the two of them, because he may control them through that so-called prophecy and may end up. And a lot of diviners are in this business. It's divination. It's not prophecy. People are now not telling people about righteousness. They're telling you about who to marry. They're telling you about how much is your bank account, the number of your bank account. Do you know me? The name of your great-grandmother. These things are spirit of divination. It looks like prophecy, but it's not. Amen? Can we stop here? Oh, one more. Okay. Oh, one more. Okay. Apostle Paul speaks about um, the, if um, the partner who is not godly departs. Uh, yes. The other person has no onions on the pe pe person. People see it as the, the person should now go and remarry. Is that the theology, sir? I will come to that. I want to say that some of these things, I don't want to jump them. When I'm teaching, the Lord wants me to take systematically. So when we get there, we want to ask it as a question and answer. Please remind me. I want to go into that in detail, what the Lord meant and supporting scriptures. Uh, so please remind me. Yes. Thank you very much, Apostle. My name is Prince. Um, in the same priest dance, I've seen a scenario, like as I walked in the sanctuary with my wife, I live without her because you've seen a right rib or better rib for her in church. How is this in the body of Christ today? with the men of God who continually do this? Well, that is error. The men of God are out of the way. How can a man go to church with his wife and man of God tells the woman, you are in a wrong marriage. There's somebody here better for you. That is part of the doctrines of demons. Part of the doctrine of demons today is rampant. As a brother told you, it's rampant. In many places where they depend on the word of prophet, prophet can make and unmake a marriage. Prophet can do anything. And people must learn to be mature to know that prophet's job does not include controlling you as to who to marry. Prophet's job does not control, does not uh, 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 include breaking your marriage. Prophet's job does not include determining who is the will of the Lord for you. That is wrong. It has no foundation. It can never be sustained. Amen. So can we close for today and pray? And then we're going to have a lot more sessions. Amen. Is that okay, Pastor Grace? Do you have anything else you wanted to add? Huh? During the course of the teaching, Apostle, we said that. Um, brethren, if you hear what is, goes on out with these prophets, and then please don't be part of those that will, you know, some prophets is like, I see a man I like, and you go to tell that, the pastor, oh, I like that man. And he say, oh, did you like the man? He says, yes. He says, okay, I connect. Some places, two of them will just come to church, and pastor knows that they're living in sin. And just join them and they move. A lot of things are happening that are ridiculous. But may the Lord have mercy. Amen. And what we say to ourselves, Father, I will not be part of that. Can we rise up for a moment and pray? Let's rise up. I want us to pray. Pray that the Lord will intervene and clean up his church. Pray that the Lord will clean up his church. The Lord will deliver his church from all the carnality, all the errors. Pray and say, Lord, start with me. Sanctify me wholly. Clean me up. Do not allow me to remain in error. Pray, brothers and sisters, pray. Call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pray for yourself. Pray for the church. Pray for the spirit of discernment. Pray that the Lord will do what only him can do. That the will of the Lord will be 
perfected in our life in the church of Yeshua. Pray for the glory of the Lord to be manifested. Pray. Ask the Lord. Say, Lord, start with me. Help me. Use me to be a vessel to restore your glory on this institution. Use me to restore the strength of this institution. Use me to restore the sanctity of this institution. I know that human beings are trying to defile it. Satan is trying to defile it. The reason why Satan wants to defile marriage, it reminds him of the head of the church, Yeshua HaMashiach. It reminds him of the union of the church and Yeshua. So in defiling marriage, Satan is trying to suggest that his vic the victory of Yeshua over him at the cross was not enough. Let's pray and say, Lord, forgive the church. Lord, forgive the church. Have mercy on the church. Let's pray that the Lord will help us to get it right. Let the Lord make things right. Let's pray that the God of heaven will make things right by his grace. Let the grace of the Lord perform it. Let's pray and say, Lord, visit your church again. Visit your church in this generation. Lord, restore the marriage institution as a vital part of kingdom culture. Restore it, O oh Lord. Restore it in our generation. You say you make the church without spot or wrinkle or other such things. Let's give the Lord right of way. Let's cooperate with him. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let us pray. Pray. Pray with some fervency, brethren. Pray with some fervency of spirit. Pray for the church of Jesus. Pray for the church to be delivered from man wisdom. Man human wisdom. Pray that the church will be pure again. It will reflect the glory of the King of Kings again. Pray for those who are going through. Let's pray. Let's use that sister, Sister Nkechi, cited as a point of contact. Everyone who is going through unfaithfulness, going through being dumped, going through any situation due to no fault of their own, let's pray that the Lord will come. The Lord will comfort that sister. The Lord will strengthen her. The Lord will restore every broken marriage. The Lord will do a work of grace. Let's pray. The Lord is still able to do a miracle after 10 years, after 15 years. Let's call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, heal your church. Heal every broken marriage. Every family that is broken, heal, oh God. Heal by your grace. Heal by your spirit. Now let's come and resist Satan right now. Let's resist Satan. Satan is the one who is walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom may devour. Let's resist him steadfastly in the faith. Let's bind every demon assigned against marriage. Every demon that is making marriage to be nasty and negative. Let's bind the demons that are principles and powers released against the marriage institution. Let's begin to command that out of the way. Bind and cast out to the Atlantic Ocean. Resist Satan. Tell him, get away from the church. This is the church of Yeshua. The divorce rate in the church now is as much as the world. In most parts of the world, is a shame. Let's resist Satan. Say, so Satan, back off. Back off from families. Now let's pray and say, Lord, sanctify your people. Listen, brethren, can we listen for a moment? If somebody is sanctified, if one person is sanctified, a marriage that will have hit the rocks will stand. And if two are sanctified, listen to this, there will be no breakup. Amen. And so the root is the old man. The 
own nature. Let's pray for the church and say, Lord, visit your church with the spirit of sanctification. Let the sword of the spirit go forth. Let truth go forth. Dig into and let the Lord deliver the church from worldliness, worldly entertainment. As Pastor Chris talked about that the church, when you are sanctified, you have no pleasure in Nollywood and Bollywood. You don't have pleasure in all those terrible things that people do on television. Let's pray right now. Sanctify your church. Cleanse your church. Purify your church. Purify your church. Sanctify your church. Sanctify your church, Lord. Sanctify your church. Pastor Nobel, come and pray. Sanctify your church. Sanctify your church. Let's pray that prayer. Lord, visit your church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name. This is the foundation. The Bible says, if the foundation be destroyed, the very foundation of the church and society. And Lord, we thank you that we know one of the things you said before the Lord returns, you, you will turn the heart of the fathers to their children. You are talking about restoration of the marriage institution, the family. You are the God of family. You are the father, both the family in heaven and on earth. And Lord, we thank you that your word is true and your word is powerful. Lord, your word has gone forth by your spirit. It will not return void. Lord, we that are here and those that have heard through the internet and those who we hear afterwards, Father, our prayer is that this world we do is work. In the name of Yeshua. Lord, let your word go to the very roots of all these issues and begin to uproot them, Lord. Lord, we pray that the works of the flesh will begin to give way to the fruit of the spirit. In first place, you talked about the sanctification of the, of the spirit and the sprinkling of the blood. Father, let the blood be sprinkled again upon our marriages, upon our families, that things will be in order as you have ordained them to be, Lord, in the name of Yeshua. Lord, we thank you that we shall be the church without spot or wrinkle. Family that are the way it is in heaven. Lord, change our mind, Lord. Change the cultures of this world that we're taking on board. Lord, that this day we come in agreement because there's a covenant of the blood that is upon the church. Not the ways of the world, but the ways of the kingdom, which is a superior way, Lord. Lord, thank you that those who are not married yet, that ears are open to hear the wisdom of the Most High. Lord, help us, Father, to be prayerful. Help us to allow your process, oh Father, to complete its work. Lord, this world will not be a condemnation to any of us, but it will be without which will save us, Lord, and deliver us from the snares of the wicked. We thank you that this day that the enemy is defeated, that Satan has, has, has fallen again, oh Lord, and has felt that his plan against the church has been broken. We thank you, Father. We seal everything with the blood. Father, we, we continue to pray and to appropriate and to apply your word, O oh Lord. And we thank you for the timely word spoken by your servant. We pray that your servant be replenished and refreshed, Lord. That more every time we come, the rest of this, this course, Lord, we come forth in fullness of power in the name of Yeshua. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's thank the Lord for